Deployed as an infantry soldier on three tours of duty to Iraq and Afghanistan, my next guest is a true military hero. Upon, in leave, upon leaving the military, uh, Girant Jones worked to protect commercial shipping against Somali and Nigerian-based piracy. He then turned his hand to writing and has co-written bestsellers on both sides of the Atlantic, including two with James Patterson. Garant has his own series of historical fiction novels with Penguin. And he's got a podcast. It's called Veteran State of Mind, which is uh, done in collaboration with the Royal British Legion. And his memoir is out now. And it's a page turner to end all page turners. It's called Brothers in Arms, published by Pan Macmillan. And Garant Jones joins me now. Hi, Garant. How you doing, mate? Thanks uh, for having good. me. Good. I've just spent the last couple of minutes before we went back on air practicing the pronunciation of your first name. Garant. Geraint. Geraint. Well, we'll give you an A for effort. I'll get I, there in I, the I, end. I just want to say as well, I have this really disturbing image now of the Queen getting thrown under a bus. Yes, I know. As someone who pledged allegiance to her, I am I'm deeply disturbed. Listen, should I cut, cut Harry a little bit of slack for my harsh words, given the fact that he has served in the military? Um, you know what? I, I've heard that he's a good bloke yes. from those that, that know him. Um, I don't want to... I, I don't know the couple, so... Yeah. Uh, but that's not going to stop me throwing my <laughs> guesses in. But um, for everything I heard, he is, a, he is a good bloke. And I think uh, all good blokes have been led astray at some point. So I will say that and uh, leave it at that, I think. Do you view people that have served in the military differently to others? Um, I used to. Um, to be quite honest, I used to have a chip on my shoulder about people that didn't. Particularly in America, I couldn't understand why people my own age, um, kind of after 9-11, had not joined up mm. you know, in the military. Now, don't get me wrong, a lot further down the line now, I'm not as sure on those wars as I was back then. But at the time, certainly, I, I did. Um, now I recognise that you can serve in all kinds of different ways and that, you know, there, there's heroes in all kinds of walks of life and everybody goes through some kind of hardship as well. So this idea that, you know, that you've seen suffering or been through suffering and nobody else can understand that is just, is just rubbish. I mean, people out there all the time, like the people out there with sick children, sick parents, you know, people out there losing their jobs... Mm. There's hardship to be found everywhere, and so I don't think the military has a monopoly on that, or you know, or or, or special because of it. Uh, what do you think about politicians or broadcasters, <laughs> writers? Well, <laughs> I won't get you started. <laughs> but but uh, anybody that comments on war that hasn't actually you know been been at war, uh, mm. are they qualified to comment? Well, look, everyone has a right to an opinion about everything. Um, I can have a right to opinion about childbirth. Um, yeah. I probably not, it doesn't really carry any weight. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't stop at opinions with politicians. They're going ahead and putting people into harm's way. And the soldiers will gladly put themselves in harm's way. Most of us are nutters. That's why we're there in the first place. We want to be in harm's way. But it's what they do, and we see it in Kabul right now, is what they, you know, their, their decisions, which might be made for, you know, for, for great reasons, but they, they have real consequences for people on the ground. And I don't believe that all politicians should have to have served in the military. I think in this day and age that would be quite ridiculous. Mm. But I think that there's something to be said for them having to go out to these places, look people in the eye, see kids with missing legs, missing limbs. Mm. Um, particularly when it comes to, you know, the arms industry in this country. You know, it, does it provide jobs? Is there an upside to it? Absolutely. But at the same time, would we be signing off on it if we saw the result of those bombs and what they do to kids in Yemen and, and places like that? And, you know... I'm, I'm not this whole thing of anti-war. I think there's a right time and a right place for war. I think, but I think that it's, it should be a last resort. And I think it's become far too easy for politicians to say, go fight. Because they, let, let's be honest, most of them don't serve. Most of them don't have children that serve. Most of them are from very comfortable middle class or upper class families who don't need, no, even know anyone that's in the military. You know, let alone anyone that's going to come home without a leg or an arm or, or in a box. Yes. I mean, when Hitler was... Uh, rampant in Europe, that wasn't a political decision to stop him, was it? I mean, yeah. he, he entered Poland, which broke an international treaty that, that we'd signed up to. Uh, and of course, you know, he, he, he threatened the very existence of this nation. So you could argue that the Second World War was extremely justified. I mean, I would suggest 100% justified. Uh, but do you look at the decision to enter Afghanistan in 2001 or indeed the two Iraq wars as more political rather than military and strategic? I think you look at the early days of Afghanistan and it was entirely justified to go after the al-Qaeda training camps post 9-11 with special forces, um, 
precision, you know, precision attacks using local forces. I think that was absolutely textbook. And if we'd have ended it there, we would look back on Afghanistan and the retaliation, because which is what it was, and retaliation for 9-11, mm. and say that this was one of the most textbook like, precision um, military operations that's ever been carried out. As it was, we then blundered into Iraq for reasons which will remain unknown for, for, to most of us. I have my own inclination on that. Um, and it's, you know, I, 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 I don't think that it was about... It wasn't definitely about the stated aims, you know, and this idea that you can have a war on terror, a war on an emotion. Mm. You know, one of the things I look back on now, and, you know, at the time I was 17 years old, pretty thick, really, as most 17-year-olds are. And I think now, why, how did we go into a war with no stated endgame? You know, how can you... The, the weapons of mass destruction that were nowhere to be seen. Right. And blaming Saddam Hussein, who was an evil man, but blaming him for the Twin Towers was far-fetched at best. Yeah, and there's just, there just no connection for that. And then nobody is held accountable for it when that, you know, there's millions of people have died as a result of the war of terror. Now, you can make an argument whether or not that's justified, but that's the fact. And, you know, you should have to answer for that. And, mm. um, the expansion into Helmand in 2006... Um, I believe, and um, there's, some, uh, there's, some, there's some great books ab about it. Uh, Losing Small Wars is probably the best one by Frank Ledwidge, um, which make the argument that the reason we went into Helmand was because we were trying to wash away the stain of failure in, in, in Iraq. And I think it's a very plausible argument. And when you look at the resources that were sent into Helmand in 2006, it was so poor that we, there was never a chance, really, from the beginning of getting things right. And... Um, I'm not a big fan of Joe Biden, and I'm definitely not a fan of this pull-out strategy in Afghanistan. Mm. But one thing I really want to stress to people is you, you can't put all the blame on this one man and this one moment when the last 20 years have been a disaster. Mm. You know, and, and yeah. really, we, we, we've gone from possibly having one of the most, um, like I said, textbook precision military campaigns of all time to, I think, arguably one of the most disastrous military campaigns that I can think of. So when should we have got out, when would it have been job done in Afghanistan? I think once basically the Al-Qaeda training camps had been destroyed, Bin Laden was on the run. What sort of, roughly, what, what sort of I time think, scale? So we're looking sometime in 2002, mm. you know. Yeah. Um, so just a, 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 an efficient 12 months with clear objectives to yeah. destroy the, uh, the infrastructure of, uh, that they had access to. And we can continue to hunt down Bin Laden, you could continue to hunt down any of the other people out there, but then for us, somehow we went from that to nation building you know, in Afghanistan. And we've seen how well that went in Libya. We, you know, we, we turned Libya into a totally failed state. Mm. Everyone seems to have forgotten, forgotten about that. Were you yeah. surprised by the uh, very swift um, surrender of the Afghan forces in the last few days? The speed of it, yes. Um, the end result, no. Um, I believe it's in Brothers in Arms um, that we said that the minute we pull out, the country's going back to the Taliban. Mm. Uh, the speed of it did surprise me. Um, and I expect, and from what I can gather from um, kind of uh, Afghan commandos and people like that who are on social media, it sounds like they were ordered to lay down their arms. Um, and it, so it sounds like some kind of deal was struck mm. and that there was this, this mass collapse. It wasn't due to people saying, I don't want to fight anymore. It was due to them following orders to stop fighting. Um, I think there's some, some kind of uh, backroom deal going on that we'll probably never find out the details about. Um, many of you... Viewers may not know that we left Basra under similar circumstances. The British Army, unbeknownst to... And British Army, I said British government, made the deal with the, um, the, the militia that we were fighting in Basra to leave the city, um, didn't tell the Iraqi government, and we left. Just, we just left Basra, um, let the militia take it back over, um, and then the Iraqi army and the Americans had to come down and retake the city. Um, I believe it was a few months later. Um, people don't know about that. But, you know, this lie, this total lie that we don't negotiate with terrorists is, mm. is exactly that. We've negotiated with the Taliban in 2006 when Easy Company of Three Para were escorted out by the Taliban from Muscala. Um, we did the same thing in 2007 in Basra with the Jaysh al-Mahdi. And now we're seeing the same thing again with the Taliban um, on a countrywide scale. You know, so we do negotiate with terrorists. We do it all the time. Um, but... Nobody uh, kind of owns up for it at the top level. Uh, with those images of the Taliban back in the presidential palace and uh, trying to work out how the gym equipment actually <laughs> operates, <laughs> which is an unedifying yeah. sight. Well, it was nearly embarrassing as me when I'm at the gym. Mm -hmm. But um, how does that feel to someone that served uh, at some point in the last two decades to see us make such a, a messy withdrawal? I mean, do you sort of think it's OK, we still achieve things? Or does it feel like all of your sacrifice was for nothing? 
well, as someone who's went through lockdown without any gym equipment, it makes me quite mad that we're leaving stuff out there for them. But yeah. I, I joke because, yeah, it is, <laughs> it is painful. Um, but to be honest, I went through the pain of that in 2014 when we finally pulled out of Helmand. We, the British troops came out of Helmand. All the towns that we fought in fell back to the Taliban in 2014. Yeah. So this, to be honest, is... like I, You know, the, the towns that we fought for, I went through this then. I know that it does hurt some people very much. Um, I know that they, I know that there's a lot of people hurting now because they 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 always they always thought that their interpreters or their colleagues from the Afghan special forces and so on would get out of the country, and I think that it's leaving those people behind that's that's really hurting people. I think if we'd have got those people out, then this would be a lot more of a, a, a it wouldn't be such a hard pill to swallow. Uh, well, I had a lot of fun reading Brothers in Arms. It's become a bestseller. It was in. Uh, hardback now it's in paperback and I read it during lockdown and it's the most amazing page turner because of course it's true and it's your life and what's fascinating about Brothers in Arms is 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 how it is uh, that you got into the military and and which part of the military that you entered you wanted to go in at the bottom you wanted to be an ordinary soldier and you wanted to fight tell me more well I'll say this I didn't start off that way it started off I wanted to be an officer but then just the once Iraq happened and Afghanistan happened, and, you know, I'll put my hand up and say that I'm a hypocrite. I don't believe that wars were justified, but, God, I wanted to be a part of them, you mm. know, and I would be again. Um, and it was probably, I don't know, it's probably got something. Some, somebody probably said something to me one day that rubbed me up the wrong way as a kid, and I, I, maybe it was a need to prove myself to other people, maybe it was a need to prove myself to myself. Yeah. But there was just, for me, there was no other option in life but to be in the army, in the infantry, and to go to combat. Um, I feel very, very fortunate that I got to go to Iraq in the years that I did and I got to go to Iraq in the years that I did mm. because a lot of people go through their military career without ever getting to have that test. And don't get me wrong, there's plenty of people out there who have had way more than a test than I have. And I never, you know, I never say that, 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 you know, that I've seen the most or done the most or anything like that, far from it. Um, but I did get my test and, and it's, it's something that I, I'm, very, I'm very grateful for in a, in a weird kind of way. Like, yeah, it messed me up in some ways, but life messes us up. Like, there's all kinds of things that, 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 will, that will, will do that to us. What kind of childhood did you have? Very good one. Mm. You know, like, I've, I've never gone without a meal, as you can tell. Like, <laughs> I've never gone you look, without a meal. You're in very... I mean, you're being a bit self-deprecating about uh, your physique, you I've know, got I'd to say. On me, I'll say that. But <laughs> it, was, um, it, 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 was, it was a good childhood. I played a lot of sports, you yeah. know, got encouraged to... Got, got, got encouraged to, to compete mm. and to do well and to not... You know, to to have to 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 be confident in um, one's abilities, um, and I think that's something that a lot of people are lacking now. And, and I, I'm very much a, a fan of, of of rugby and those kind of contact sports because I think, you know, it's very hard to get into that kind of um, it's very hard to get into that kind of stuff when you're older. And, mm. I'm, and, and I'm glad that I was thrown in on the deep end, um, you know, literally with uh, with a lot of those things. And um, yeah, I can't fault it. To be quite honest. Yeah, I mean, if you've got uh, questions. Uh, for Geraint, then uh, all I want you to do is send me an email right now at gbviews at gbnews.uk at gbnews as well. Um, so what precipitated your decision to actually enter the military? What does that mean? What came before? Yeah, I mean, what, what <laughs> motivated it? Because basically you weren't a competitive ad, you were sporty, but it's quite a leap from that into the army, isn't it? Um, I, have this, I have a theory that um, a certain percentage of people are born with certain genetic dispositions mm. to certain careers. Um, there's always a section of society that, war or not, wants to go off and do war. There always, there's always, there always is. And thank God for that. Well, because we need, yes we need no, a proportion of the a population to be willing to fight. I mean, well, we're very lucky there, that you there, want to do it. There is that, but then there's also the thing of how many, uh, how many unnecessary fights are caused because mm -hmm. of it, you know. So I do think it goes, it goes both ways. But you look, at, look around the world, you know, the reason people join gangs, I think, is the same reason a lot of the time they join the military. They want belonging, they want a team, they want people who they can call brothers. Um, are they a bit fearless as well? I mean, is there, is there a part there, of the personality that, type? No, I, I, I don't think it's anything. To, I don't. I don't believe there's, there's such a thing as not having fear. Mm. Um, it's it's more a case of how good you are at pretending you don't have fear. Mm. Um, if there wasn't, if 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 people were fearless, then what they did would not be courageous. You know, because if you don't have fear, then what does it matter? Like you know, if and 
And there are some people out there, I'm sure, who are just total nutcases who don't have fear. But I think generally your British soldier, he has plenty of fear, but it just does a very good job of shoving it down into his stomach and getting on with the job anyway. So how did you adapt to your first few days and weeks in the forces? Was, well, it, was it a rude awakening? Not, not really for me, because I did. I, I had a very soft route in because I joined the TA, uh, was the reserves as it's called now, when, mm. I was a, um, when I was in sixth form. So it's a kind of a, it was a very soft kind of entry. I wasn't, you know, battered by some angry, drunk Glaswegian corporal up in, in Catrick for, for weeks on end, like a lot of people have. And so I, I had a very kind of soft entry into that and a very kind of unusual one because, um, you know, I, I used that really as the back door to go to the forces because I, I, I was set on the fact I wanted to go out. Iraq was happening, Afghanistan was happening. I wanted to go out to those places and get those experiences. I was very keen on doing as absolute minimum amount of time in the UK, in barracks as possible. I just wanted to go out on, on the overseas exercises, on, on the deployments. You know, that was what I was interested in. And so if I could find a way of doing a two-week course instead of a 12-week one or whatever it is, then, then, I, would, then I would take that. And, um, and then, you know, can I hit the ground running once I got to Iraq? And you wanted to get your hands dirty. You wanted to fight. Yeah, 100%. And to be honest, I still, you know, I not, not really regret now because it's not something I could control, but... My first tour, I would say that, you know, in Iraq in 2006, people don't understand that it was actually more deadly than Afghanistan at the time. Um, but it was never covered. Um, you know, we could have done with GB News at the time, but plug, because we, we did, it wasn't covered in, in the news. And Afghanistan was, and everybody thought that, that Iraq was some peacekeeping walk in the cake, which it wasn't. But I wasn't in the thick of it there. And that really annoyed me because it was, it was almost like being on the bench for an important game. But you didn't get on the pitch. Yes. Wow. Um, and then I, that's why I stayed on. I did back to back tours so that I could get that, you know, get that experience on the second tour. But even so, it was like very much at that time, I was still um, very much kind of like awed by the, by the experience and awed by the army itself. And um, it wasn't really until I got to Afghanistan that I think I found my groove as a soldier. And you talk in the book about the wonderful camaraderie and the banter, the incredibly dark humour. Oh, yeah. Uh, and also, a lot of the exchanges are pretty brutal. You know, it wouldn't work in Snowflake Britain, would it? Some of the language used. Uh, I mean, it, it, it wouldn't. And, and the only thing that was off limits was making jokes about people's kids. Mm. Um, anything else, anything else went. But like these, these, you know, I'm a, I'm a soft lad from a middle class family. Most of these lads have come from absolutely brutal backgrounds, um, and they're hard. They're hard blokes. And like when we look at Snowflake Britain, like, yeah, don't get me wrong, there's a lot going on now that I really disagree with. But we are still a nation, I believe. There's a lot of very hard people around, yeah. around this country, um, in council estates and across the country. You go to any boxing club in the country, you're not going to find snowflakes in there. You're going to find tough Brits. And but I, are, I still are the think snowflakes we have that in the ascendancy? Are they taking over? Are they sort of... They, they defining, will be, are they defining the country now? They will, they will be until the proverbial hits the fan. Mm. And then, you and know. what would that be? A war or, uh, I don't know, a recession? What, what might it be that gets rid of it? I, I really don't know, mate. And to be honest, the sad thing about one of the things of the human condition is that we have to hit that point mm. for it to, you know, we seem intent on destroying ourselves until we hit this point where we realise how lucky we are and take some kind of crisis to put us through it. I was actually hoping that that was what was going to happen last year. But I think, to be quite honest, without wanting to diminish anything for anyone who's lost anybody or anything like that, which mm. is obviously terrible, I think we thought at the beginning of COVID that it was going to be a lot worse than it would be. Mm. Um, and, if you, and that's not just me saying that. If you look at the projections at the beginning, it has been better than what Definitely. We, we were told half a million deaths by Professor Neil Ferguson of Imperial so, College. Right. So it hasn't been as bad. And I, I, I think that in a way it's, it's kind of broken us because rather than being bad enough to make people rise up to the challenge, it's kind of allowed people to still be quite soft. But at the same, and at the same time become absolutely fearful and, and terrorised to the point where we're now looking at each other as, 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 you know, a danger to each other, whereas, you know, like, I, I do believe Britain is one of the best countries in the world. The reason I speak out a lot about what's going on is because I want to keep it that way. Mm. Um, and I, I think it's extremely sad to see, you know, this point where people are turning on each other, you know, so much. And not to say I haven't been guilty of that myself, mm. because it can be very hard not to want to grab someone and shake someone, mm. you know, when, they, when you do feel that they are... You know, my, my granddad was, he was, he flew on bombers on Lancasters in the Second World War. Wow. I went past the Bomber Command Memorial the other day, 55,000 dead. 
Only the um, infantry in the trenches in the First World War and the U-boat crews had a higher casualty percentage. And when you see what they went through, and, and, and like the ordeal that they went through, not just the, the casualties that they suffered, but the, the civilian casualties that they inflicted, yeah. they had to carry that cost for the rest of their life. And they did that to give us certain freedoms, certain liberties. And, and it's very sad to see those like, gladly handed over by a lot of people for this illusion of safety. Yeah, uh, remarkable stuff. And clearly, courage is in your DNA, given your grandfather's story. Lots of questions coming in. And I've got to say, everyone is just uh, full of admiration uh, for you. Uh, oh, Joe you. asks, what was your scariest moment in battle? Um, a scariest moment? To be honest, it's not actually when the bullets are flying or when things are blowing up. Um, it's in Afghanistan, particularly. It's when you think that there's an IED, um, which is a roadside bomb. But they weren't roadside in Afghanistan, they were under the dirt. And you have to go forward and, and confirm it, which basically is a posh way of saying you get your bayonet out, you stick it in the dirt, and you use your fingertips to brush away the, the dirt to find the bomb. And um, people think that that's a job that, you know, the, the, the hurt locker bomb disposal guys do, which they do, but you, you, most of your bombs are found by your infantry soldiers, mostly 18-year-old lads on mm. the other side of the world. And um, it's those moments that are scary because there's nothing going on to distract you. You're just very aware of the fact that if anything goes wrong, then you're about to go home in a, in a tin, basically.